everybody. I hope everyone is doing fantastic today. I am here with a, a fairly recurring guest on this channel. I am here with the CEO of Chia.net, Gene Hoffman, today. Gene, how are you today, man? Welcome back. Doing well, man. Thank you very much for having me on. Of course, man. I'm always happy to have you. I always love having discussions with you. I think you embody the ideals of the cypherpunk principle. You've been here from the beginning, and it's always great to speak with you. So thank you for coming on, man, and taking the time. My pleasure. Absolutely. So let's just get started here. So, Gene, I think we spoke about the last time you and I spoke was I think it was you, Bram, and I. So it's been about two months or so. So I want to ask you about the new projects that have launched on Chia over the last few months. Are there any of them that you'd like to mention today? There's certainly a few that are interesting. Um, okay. you know, I don't remember whether the uh, first retirements of carbon had occurred, but Sumitomo Corporation and Milan bought some of the first CAD Trust carbon and retired it on chain. And that was pretty cool. Like, that was a uh, you know, summer. It might have been right around we spoke. But the other things yeah. I find interesting is there's a new um, over-collateralized stablecoin that's in the process of launching. Cool. Um, you know, that's pretty darn cool. And then, you know, there's just been a lot of smaller things. Uh, the Ozone Wallet recently shipped. Uh, there's a This Week in Chia by one of the community members. It just does an excellent job of keeping it up on a week-to-week -week basis. And obviously, you know, we'll talk about some other things, but like, you know, we've added a board member that I think is going to be critical yeah. and important. And so, you know, a lot's been happening. Yeah, no, I, I've seen that. I mean, I was reading the, um, you guys have a, a, a newsletter that you guys bring out and I was reading it and I saw like all of the updates and I was like, wow, you know, there's, there's a lot going on here. And so there's another thing that's going on, almost seems like a, uh, conference quasi hackathon and, and that's the, um, the first developer round table to occur. So the first the Chia developer round table. So tell us about that. And what will be the topics that will be discussed in this primarily? What, what, what's the plan for this? Well, these are basically like 45 minute community meetings for people who are, you know, writing Chia Lisp or developing just outside of Chia Lisp. You know, in other words, cool. you're writing an application that's calling RPCs, those kinds of things. Right. There's probably going to be like a agenda topic on each one of them, though it's not meant necessarily to drive the agenda. It's more a, you know, we'll at least talk about this. And so for this next one, it's really going to be a developer facing changes that came in 2.0 uh, and, you know, those kinds of things. There's a bunch of um, soft and hard forks that are kind of floating around. And a lot of the soft forks add a lot of functionality. Things like uh, zero knowledge proofs are now available uh, and additional signature algorithms to be able to do custody with kind of traditional custody hardware is also out there. So that gives you some options of different things to do. So, you know, very much meant to be a time and a place virtually to get together people who are developing. One of the things we see a lot of is, you know, with Sebastian, for example, out on his own doing Circle Dow, Circuit Dow, pardon me, which is the over collateralized stablecoin, you know, he and Yak often like share tips about like better ways to develop. And so we really want this to be a venue where those kinds of conversations can pop up. And also to make sure that, you know, as we continue to roll out a lot of additional both uh, documentation and how-tos that people are aware of those and, you know, making sure people get pointed at them. So really just an attempt to make sure that we have a time to, you know, get everybody together, make sure everybody's aware of all the resources and, you know, be resources to each other in a way that's very developer-focused because, you know, our community has a huge farmer base. I mean, we're near 100,000 full nodes, as you know, and that means there's, yeah, more, than, huge. there's more than that farming because a lot of people use kind of, you know, multi-node farmers, so it's probably still mm -hmm. another 120,000 people, maybe 200. Uh, that's huge. Yeah. So so a lot of our conversation is very much, you know, which hard drive did you buy? And it's not, you know, how do I implement Uniswap v3 in, in mm -hmm. Lisp? And, you know, that, that right now is the more important focus. You know, it's really driving and unleashing what you can do. And, in fact, one of the things that's great about, uh, for example, PetSwap is I think there's been some skepticism that we could really do anything you could do on Ethereum and better. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a great example of how much more decentralized, there's no centralized monolithic smart contract. There are, you know, individual smart contracts for each pair that anybody mm -hmm. can themselves create as well, right? So it's, you know, all those things, but then it looks from a user's perspective like Uniswap. And so, you know, it's got all those pieces, but is truly decentralized in a way like Yak can't rug pull somebody. It's of cool course. stuff like that. Anyway, long story short, it's a, it's a venue to really come together and, explore kind of the edges of what's possible already and what's already been done and like find resources. You know, there was uh, a React Native uh, BLS implementation that I don't think a lot of people know about, which would let you do, you know, easier Android and iPhone direct integrations and, and stuff like that. I want to make sure everybody's hearing about. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and what, I, what I'm really focused on, what I really like about what you said was the concept of, of monolithic versus modularity in blockchains. I'm starting to see a lot of um, proof of work consensus mechanism, uh, uh, con, uh, consensus algorithm blockchains focus more on the lines of modularity as opposed to a monolithic type mind, a, t- a monolithic type uh, structure. And I'm also starting to see blockchains start to really consider the value behind zero knowledge proofs uh, for those who may not know what that is, ZK rollups. Um, and the, the, the idea of having an actual stable coin. And I think those are very valuable prospects for a blockchain, especially one that's as decentralized as Chia is having 120,000 nodes, arguably more than likely the most decentralized chain out there by node volume, by mo- by, excuse me, by node count. So having those I- integrations is very, very important. And, I want to ask you this then. So you brought up um, a consensus algorithm. You brought up zero knowledge proofs. You brought up a, a stable coin. And it seems like all of these create a formula for enterprise adoption. And it's obvious that many blockchain projects are, even if they're trying to be retail based, they're very focused on, even if they're trying to be enterprise-based, they're, they're solely focused on retail, even if they're trying to be enterprise-based. So I want to ask you, how is Chia setting the stage for enterprise adoption as opposed to just retail adoption, per se? So there's two things that, you know, when we talk to serious enterprise customers matter. It's both network security and it's application security. And so, you know, in network security, there's a lot of skepticism about proof of stake. You know, of I've course. had major banks say, you know, Vitalik will never be able to sensor bank transactions, and they believe that he could in the current kind of implementation of proof of stake there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, people want Bitcoin's level of security or better, but the problem is they can't be seen to be using that much power to get there, especially when you start forecasting forward a decade, right? It's not oh, today's power use, it's 10 years from now's power use. So, you know, if you're a major American bank, that's just not a comfortable place to be. So if you can solve that problem, then proof of space and time has demonstrably solved the decentralization and efficiency of, uh, you know, running a Nakamoto consensus. Of course. Then you get to application security. And, And a lot of people don't think about Ethereum this way, but Ethereum smart contracts are centralized and monolithic and require two assumptions. First, if the developer has claimed that they've let go of administrative control, You've got to make sure they actually have. You know, we've seen people who didn't actually let go of it and had a backdoor and used it. And then the second thing is that because of the like decentralized monolithic smart contract, which isn't very really decentralized, mm-hmm. the North Koreans can spend all day every day figuring out whether there is a backdoor in it. Yes. And, and so from that perspective, you know what you've seen in like today, Citibank was out talking about this. Yep. They run a private blockchain that you know has some value because it lets them move money between their various global organizations. Yes, but it, so it, loses, it loses the entire network effect of like interacting with JP Morgan, who mm-hmm. also has a service on their private blockchain. And now you're back at bridges. Now they run the private blockchains because they can keep the North Koreans off of them. And of so course. therefore, you know, no one can figure out a backdoor and you know they don't have to worry about losing other people's money, bank money, right? Mm-hmm. But Chialisp in its truly decentralized nature and its modularity really gives a lot more confidence that the applications that banks and governments want to build can and will work in this kind of adversarial environment. And, you know, already the World Bank vetted us. We have uh, an application awesome. with them. Um, that is the Climate Action Data Trust. Uh, yes. It's run by a Singapore entity, which is a partnership between the AIDA, the World Bank, and the government of Singapore. And it's in production. Um, it's got three or four registries already. Vera is very close. Their uh, CEO was quoted about two weeks ago saying that they'd have about 100% of the carbon, the voluntary carbon market in the CAD trust by the end of, what well, I think he said, by Q4, which is kind of the end of this month. Yeah. And knowing what's going on, he's not far off. Let's say it that way. And, you know, with that, as we talked about, the next big step is carbon tokenization. And with all of yes. the actual major registries being both, you know, registration and settlement on the Chia blockchain, we expect a large part of all the tokenization to occur on the Chia blockchain. And, you know, when you start having these things like AMMs and expiring offer files yes. and, you know, DEXI, you all of a sudden, like, give a carbon project an almost immediate platform to create a liquid market in their, you know, just registered with Vera mm-hmm. project. 
you know, all of a sudden they get all those market tools that other people are using for other cats. And then also you know, they have ultimately multiple stable coins that they could go make an offer to somebody like a Microsoft and say, here's 10,000 tons. And, you know, we want, oh gosh, what is that? $120,000. I'm probably doing the math wrong. Uh, but, you know, you can send an offer file via email and actually do that transaction in real time trustlessly between the carbon project and the corporate buyer. It's a pretty powerful capability. And for the buyer, it's very good because one of the problems you always had in the past is, has this carbon been sold twice? And now right. with CAD Trust, you know, you can go audit and make sure that the carbon coin you're about to buy is correctly in the CAD Trust, that it's marked that way. You can walk the chain and make sure that, you know, if only 50,000 tons were created. There's only 50,000 tons in that cat. And then when you get that cat and retire it, you know for sure that all 50,000 tons were retired. And minutes later, that retirement's going to show up in a CAD Trust too. So it just really changes the trust metric. It makes it so for buyers, the only thing you have to really vet mm -hmm. is the registration itself. You know, did this meet Vera's standard, even though Vera said it did, right? And once you agree to that, everything else now is fully auditable. Absolutely. And what I like what I like hearing is what you were talking about before as well about the notion of proof of stake. Now, unfortunately, with banks, we're seeing how proof of stakes, proof of stake, blockchains can sometimes be inherently risky, especially if they have layer twos on them that have back doors. And we've seen that, unfortunately, on Ethereum. So there, there's an issue with that. And I can understand why banks are very trepidatious in, in participating in blockchain when there's a possibility that their transactions can can be can be uh, misappropriated, to say the least. And when you're talking about the ability to create a type, a, a carbon paradigm, a net car, a, a carbon credit paradigm within Chia. It's very important to note for people who may not realize that it's huge to think. It's it's huge in the fact that right now a lot of uh, a lot of states in America, specifically California, specifically <coughs> excuse me, specifically California, and a lot of countries in Europe. They're attempting to go net, I think it's net carbon zero if I'm saying that properly. Correct me if I am. Okay. So net carbon zero. And when you're having that paradigm as a blockchain, it becomes a very enticing prospect. When you look at a lot, this this demeaning this, this demeaning notion in cryptocurrency that cryptocurrencies create a lot of pollution because the computational power thereof of proof of work and proof of stake. But when you're talking about Shia talking about the carbon neutral or carbon zero, type paradigm, it becomes a very enticing prospect to the real world, especially with, with countries in the West that are really trying to tackle this problem head on. So I, I wanted to highlight that. It's very important to bring that up. And I just want to say, uh, Ted D5, uh, thank you so much for the $20 super chat. That really does help the channel. So thank you so much. It really does. So thank you. Hello, Corey and Jean. The Tang Dang, the Tang Dang appreciates you both. Keep up the great guests, Corey. Chi is an amazing place for NFT artists. That's another thing. You guys have a great place for NFTs. I've seen a lot of mints happen on Chia from Chia enthusiasts. This is not something I've, this is not, I've, this is not the first time I've seen NFTs become a very, very, very large component of what entices people to join Chia. Well, the thing about NFTs on our chain is that they actually enforce royalties in the offer file format. That's so you can do direct peer-to-peer -peer trading, and you know you can do things like trade two, two of your NFTs for one of their NFTs, which is really hard to do in the other paradigms. Yes. The thing that's really excited us is we've seen a lot of folks who are now minting on multiple chains, including Gia, because they're excited about what it brings to artists. And right. certain artists have literally said, I'm done with Ethereum. Uh, you know, Dracatus and others are saying, you know, look, this is a superior infrastructure. It really does what we say. But what we also love about NFTs in the Gia blockchain is that we have real banks looking at using NFTs as digital twins. Yes, and we have, uh, you know, folks trying to think about stopping counterfeiting of luxury goods. Uh, with NFTs. And again, it's because these NFTs are both programmable from a custody perspective. So you can have things like both you could update by selling your bicycle to somebody else, or if you forgot to, and the new buyer can prove to the bicycle company, they should have gotten the NFT and then go back and have the bicycle company updated. But if the bicycle company tries to update it without your permission, you can yeah. stop it. Right. Like that's the way this stuff is supposed to work. And that's actually relatively straightforward in Chia in a way that's very hard in Bitcoin or Ethereum today. Uh, and that's because, the, you know, the custody tools are just so painful or the NFT standards are pretty poor. But, yeah, no, I mean, you know, when we talk about enterprise adoption, we've got real enterprise adoption. You have a lot of blockchains that talk about carbon. There's actual real 
Paris Agreement Carmen that has been issued and retired by Melon Corporation, which is a partnership of Mercado Libre. And then Sumitomo Corporation of America continues to own carbon on chain in their wallet on the GIA blockchain. And those are just the beginning. You know, there are additional corporate buyers who want to offset, usually with tree planting, uh, their carbon footprint. And it's the net zero initiatives in the U.S. that are really driving a lot of this. I mean, it's a $2 billion annual turnover kind of market. And it's going to be moving quickly to being tokenized. Of course. And I can only imagine that that type of market is going to increase over time as it stands. So that, that makes perfect sense. And I want to ask you now about your board of directors. So you recently onboarded someone by the name of Norm Minai. Am I saying that properly? That's correct. Yep. Okay. So Norm Minai to the chief of board of directors. So I wanted to ask you about his expertise and how his, his expertise will assist in the growth of Chia as a whole. Well, he is an old school banker who loves technology and truly believes that blockchains are here to revolutionize how that industry works. You know, he's already an advisor to the San Francisco Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, he is very plugged in to the, you know, bank CEO community and the financial mm -hmm. infrastructure community. And so I think he just brings both a, a set of credibility that's valuable and a set of network contacts that are excellent. And then vice versa, I think he makes it much easier in certain cases for people to approach us. Because you know, there are a lot of banks hearing that there's real things happening. Being known as the blockchain that the World Bank chose means a lot in the banking business. Um, you know, it's a very prestigious kind of thing. And so, so I think he's really a great bridge to that traditional financial infrastructure that has so much to gain from adopting truly decentralized blockchains. Absolutely. No, and I appreciate that. It's very important to be able to, because I, th I think there's a unfortunate disdain with and we see this a lot with, with, with Ripple, for example, where this you have this amalgam of individuals that have a background in legacy finance that come into the digital asset world because of the cypherpunk zeitgeist of uh, we don't want to be involved with banks. We don't want to be involved in legacy finance. But the maturation of this market is really dependent on the, 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 amal the amalgamation of the benefits of legacy finance and the benefits of digitization of, of crypto of crypto assets, so I think that having him on board, especially being an advisor to that prestigious of of, a, of an entity, that's a huge deal to have on your board of directors. And I want to ask you this then, because you have a um, you have a recent collaboration that I just saw, um, which is a collaboration with uh, Tangem. Um, what is that about specifically? Like, how did this collaboration occur? What does it do for for both you guys? How is this mutually beneficial? It's basically the first really good hardware wallet available for Chia. Um, cool. You know, you can easily implement a very good kind of offline wallet in you know custom hardware. You know, think Raspberry Pi, but this is a whole other right. level. Um, it's NFC. It is using your mobile phone. Um, it's got a pretty neat uh, security model to it. And what's great about it is that you can really set up kind of different ways to back up without 24 words, without steel, or, you know, all of these kind of really painful things. So from our perspective, um, they were one of the first providers to implement BLS signatures. And so that was one of the things that kind of drove us together. Uh, and so we were really able to get them using it in production for the first time. And for them, you know, it's an interesting community. I think we've done a pretty good job of, uh, of driving you know, card sales because people are interested in having a good offline wallet. And, you know, ultimately we think it's going to be a component of, and one of the choices you have as we launch vaults, which let you use multiple hardware devices and kind of, you know, customized paper wallets, for example, so that you have these kinds of, you know, over time collapsing. If somebody steals your NFTs, you may have two hours to steal them back. But, you know, if they steal your money, they can get to days one seventh of your wallet, but they can't get the other six sevenths and you'll notice mm -hmm and get that money back. You know, we're heading to that. And we want that to be really easy. We want your phone, you know, your phone plus a tangent. These are the things that are going to make it so that your mortals can really self-custody and not have, I think Mark Cuban lost $800,000 in the last yep. couple of days, right? Yep. That has to stop. It does. It, it does have to stop. I just had a conversation. We I was just on around the blockchain prior to this, and we were talking about Mark Cuban and, and how someone as well-known and affluent and prestigious as he is, when when the mainstream audience sees that and they see that someone as prestigious as him gets hacked, it becomes a very it become this industry becomes very intimidating and trepidatious when somebody sees, oh, this guy got hacked for 870k and they almost took 2.5 million dollars worth of polygon from Matic from him. So if I'm a no coiner 
and I see that in, in, in the news, I'm going to be very prudent in coming into this space. So it, 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 I absolutely agree with you. It has to stop. I think cold storage needs to set a, a precedent. And I think a lot of people really need to take security so, so it should be the number one thing in cryptocurrency, in my opinion, hence the fact of cryptography and security thereof. But fortunately, not many people take that seriously. So all I want to ask for everyone in the chat to do, because I see there's about 60 of you in here, and I'm sure there's another like 10 on Twitter. Make sure to follow Gene Hoffman on Twitter. I have his link in the description. Make sure to check out Chia.net. I have the link in that description as I have the link in that description as well. Check out Gene Hoffman's uh, key base. I have that link in the description as well. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Please consider donating to the channel through Super Chats. It does help the channel grow, and it does help the video's algorithm. So I just wanted to bring those links up. So, so – I, I know you're a busy man, Gene, and I, and I don't want to take up much more of your time. But I just saw another. I saw another very important update that I that I wanted to bring up to you, which is the roadmap update. And what are some exciting developments that are set to occur in the world of Chia by the end of let's say this year and maybe Q1 of next year? So we're definitely kind of focused on some of the enterprise delivery items that we need, and one of the first ones of that is vaults. Um, vault is this concept that instead of having like a single key that you know is your be all end all and you have to back it up with 24 words right this is a horrible idea instead what you do is you create a singleton you know it as an nft and the idea is that you have rules on how assets owned by that singleton can be spent and you can say okay i'm going to have it so that one of these three keys any one of them can spend but different keys can do different things so like the phone the, the key that's tied and generated the secure element on your iPhone is your primary key, but it might be rate limited. So they can only spend like one seventh of your wallet per week. Um, you know, and it would be what you'd usually use. But if you lost your iPhone, your second device is maybe a ledger or a tangent, and you can use that to rekey out your iPhone, but it's going to take eight hours for that to be effective so that if you yeah. still have your iPhone, you absolutely can cancel that and go, crap, I've lost my other key. I'm going to rekey that one out and create a new key there. And you'll notice how you're changing the keying. You're not like spending the assets. Because the idea here is, is that you want to use time and the programmability of Chia Lisp and Vaults to make it so that mere mortals can screw up and recover. You know, mm -hmm. it's like if you're sending something, you know, it, it, some people may want a 20-minute delay on their wallet at all times. And one of the things we couldn't do in the past and just ship some of the primitives to do was right now when you have typo clawbacks, which we support, you know, you create this kind of drop coin that is in, con, under control of both people until it's only under control of the person you send it to. Well, you actually can do things where it says, hey, until this time, I can claw this back, but after this time, I can't. And so that's now available in the kind of primitives. And so you can actually have it be that – you know, as a receiver of somebody who had a 20 minute time lock on their coins, you know, you've got the coin or I'll say, say definitely, you know, the, the money is real and is in your wallet. However, you know, it's not valid until that time's passed. Right. But once that time passes, we're done. It's in your wallet. You own it with that. Hopefully your vault instead of their vault. So, right. um, so, so that capability is just really powerful. And with that, uh, you'll be seeing, um, you know, I believe the next release, the that offers will have a kind of default timeout now. It's like these offers aren't valid after 24 hours, 20 minutes, uh, right. and you can kind of set that. And obviously, you can opt out if you want to have an offer that's about you know indefinitely valid. But we think that average users want to have a timeout on those because I think they kind of expect not to wait like two weeks later and the market moves and something sells they didn't expect, right? But that's also going to have really interesting impacts for Dexy dot space and others where you can kind of create a liquid market of offer files that only settle on chain so they move as fast as web 2. so excited about that um, on the enterprise side really excited about version two of our verifiable credentials it's really using your vault to have identity and access and being able to do that access off chain so you know once you say have access to a computer system you prove that off chain in a way that you don't have to do any on-chain spending you don't have to reveal anything except to the thing, the system you're trying to authenticate to. You know, it'll allow kind of like massive login with Chia, login with Chia to your email, uh, prove that you have a driver's license without showing your street address. I mean, you know, yeah. we, we don't think about this, but like when you go to a bar, you're handing a whole bunch of data that they don't yes, need. You, are. you know, they don't need your driver's license number. They need to know it's a valid driver's license. They need to know that you're over 21, and that is the only fact they need. Full stop. And the neat thing about well-done verifiable credentials is they let you disclose only the data necessary to kind of truly meet the need 
of whatever's being verified. So we think that's really interesting. You know, there are additionally like ledger integrations coming in the same sort of time frame as awesome. one of the various hardware pieces. But you know, we're more excited initially about Android and iPhone. So high end Android and all iPhones from way back, as well as MacBooks and iPads, can now be signing devices that secure your vault on Gia. So, you know, you can have a world where, like, your phone is your primary, but then your lap- laptop is a secondary, and your iPod might, I- iPad might be a third. And each one of them can have different rules about what they're capable of doing. Like, the, you know, the backup key may only be able to spend an NFT, but it, with uh, a two-hour delay. Like, it's the only way it can spend. But the primary key could see that something got spent with a two-hour delay and go, whoa, whoa, stop. Come back here. Yep. Right? So there's all sorts of really cool things you can do to really customize your custody rules very yep. easily and very completely. And I think one of the things to be really interesting is starting to roll out uh, wizards for that. You know, here are kind of the various work streams or ideas like, you know, if you're a farmer and you want a cold wallet, this is what we'd suggest. Or if you're an NFT collector, these are what you're going to suggest. And, you know, maybe you want to take your best NFTs and move them to a different key, uh, uh, make them only spendable by one specific key in the, in the vault. But, and that would also require a clawback because you don't expect to sell it anytime soon. Of Versus, course. you know, the ones that you expect to trade that don't have those clawbacks on them. And you're probably less worried about, you know, somebody getting your key and grabbing that. Mm-hmm. Awesome. No, no, I really appreciate you you highlighting all these very exciting things coming up for Chia and all these intricate components thereof that people can be excited for going into 2024. And we actually have a question uh, from the, a community member in the chat. Thank you so much for the $5 super chat, Chia chat. It really does help the channel. So thank you so much. Um, he asks Gene, when do you think Chia will be able to be bought on more exchanges? Also, please add... Um, advertise Chia more so many people don't know about it. I think what he's saying is, do you, um, would you be able to advertise it more, I'm guessing, and also the um, the exchange with, uh, listings, I'm guessing, is what he's conveying. Yep. So, you know, we continue to expand the exchanges that we're listed on. We work with all the folks that we're not currently listed on and have no reason to believe that we won't sooner or later be added to many of them. You know, the ad dollar spin question, you know, we're doing a lot of things to do that. You know, by building a real community and a real farmer base, we want yes, that I agree. to be a very strong way we get the word out. But where we sit today is that the 80% of people who don't have anything to do with blockchains right now, at best, don't care and at worst, hate us. And it's not a small category. So I we agree. think it's more important for the entire industry that we get across the line these major American banks, these big enterprises, these European companies that have real problems, they're going to start using the Chia public blockchain because that lets people start to see, you know, this industry is too complex to figure out if you're just a normal person. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, comparing Bitcoin to Ethereum to Chia is not something your average person really can do. And we've got to change that. And the way we're going to do that is with social proof around folks like the World Bank and Milan and Sumitomo Corporation of America using a public blockchain in public for real money. To me, that's going to have more impact than the incremental, let's get somebody to buy and pump. That's just not necessarily what I want to do. Of course. Absolutely. I mean, most of the times when you see listings on new exchanges, it's, it's a short-lived pump that it, if it's not a bull market, it generally retraces. I mean, if you, for example, a perfect example, of this was what happened with VeChain a few weeks ago. Um, they were listed on Coinbase and uh, they went up like 12, 13% for what I saw. But to my knowledge, they've retraced back since they got listed. So I, I you make a very good point on that respect. And, and all I want to say, Gene, is I really appreciate your time today. And I, and I hope that the people who aren't familiar with Chia who watch this video do check out Chia. I have all the links in the description, and I and I appreciate everyone who came here today. And most importantly, Gene, as always, I love having you on. I have you on. I at least try to have you on once every two months. You know, whether it be just you and you or you and Bram, uh, I'm very appreciative of it. And uh, keep doing what you're doing for this ecosystem, man. We need it. Thank you, Corey. Absolutely, guys. And make sure to like. I'm and sorry. Thank you, the ecosystem too. Absolutely, yes. The ecosystem, the community, is what drives industry. So please, please remember that. So please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Follow Gene on Twitter. I have his link in the description. Check out Chia on uh, check out Chia.net. I have the link in the description as well. And Gene, I'm sure I'll have you on either next month or the month after. Love to see you again, Kari. Thanks. Absolutely again. Take care, Gene. Be well. Thanks. Cool. Okay. All right.